Uh, this is the minimize AD dependency as you move to the cloud. Uh, and this is the safe harbor statement that I'm not going to walk you through. Uh, but uh, you're going to have to trust me on, on uh, it's, it's watertight legalese. <laughs> uh, my name is Marcus Hardwig. I'm a product marketer uh, here at, at, at Okta for the Universal Directory. Uh, I'm going to be joined on stage today uh, by Saima Dali, who's a product manager for the directories. And um, we're also going to have a CSM, Marisa Henderson, and a customer, uh, Ryan Walker from Chick-fil-A, talk a little bit about how you can uh, minimize uh, your AD dependency as you move to the cloud. Uh, we're also going to have a quick look at the roadmap, what we've accomplished so far this year, and where we're heading. Uh, but I'd like to, to uh, kick this session off with a, with a small story. Uh, and this is a story that's been circulated for, for quite a while. Uh, but it's the story of how when uh, NASA was finishing up the, uh, the Apollo space program, they were shooting up these uh, huge 30 stories tall uh, 7 5 rockets, right? And they were getting this tiny capsule back with, uh, with the astronauts. And that was because they were primarily geared towards landing on the moon and getting people safely back. Uh, but NASA quickly realized that future space missions weren't going to be about landing on the moon. They were going to be cargo missions to space. You're going to build the space station. We're going to continue putting satellites and, and fix the Hubble telescope and, and, and all that, right? So they quickly set out to uh, design a spaceship of the future. Uh, and this was a completely clean slate that they had. Uh, and they eventually settled on what was to become the space shuttle. Uh, however, there's a lot of consi design considerations for them when they were designing this. Uh, and one were, of course, how much cargo it could carry up. Uh, however, they were heavily constrained in size to, uh, for the cargo based on these uh, white solid rocket boosters that you have on the side here. The, uh, orange thing in the middle is the fuel tank. Uh, these rocket boosters is basically what propelled the space shuttle out uh, through, through Earth's atmosphere and, and brought the space shuttle out into space. Uh, they were not manufactured by NASA. They were manufactured uh, by a company called Foycol, and they were shipped by a train to Cape Canaveral in Florida. Uh, they were heavily uh, limited on how big they could be based on the size of trains. Specifically, uh, in Utah, uh, the train goes through mountains, so they needed to fit through the tunnels, the, the train tracks and, and, and the tunnels through there. Uh, and this quickly sort of became a, a question uh, that someone asked, well, who decided that trains were going to be the size that they are, right? The train tracks and, and, and all that. Because at some point, I guess, there was a pretty much a clean slate building out the railroads in, in America. You weren't constrained by land and, and stuff like that, right? Um, so the answer to that was that, well, the trains in, in the U.S. are the exact same specifications uh, as the trains in the U.K. Uh, a lot of people who built the railroads uh, came over from the U.K. And, and they said, let's just use the same specifications as we have. And that way we can also ship, you know, uh, railroad uh, carriages and stuff like that over. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but you get a vision that at some point someone made a decision in the U.K. what their train tracks were going to be. And what was that decision based on? Uh, well, the answer to that is they are the exact same uh, specifications as the tramways that they had. Tramways were the predecessors to, to trains, and they were these horse-drawn carriages that you can see on, on, the, on the side here. Okay, fair enough. That still doesn't really answer the question, though. Who decided that tramways were going to be the size that the tramways were? Uh, and the answer to that is they are the exact same size as these ancient Roman roads. Uh, the Roman Empire were the first to build out roads uh, all throughout Europe, all the way up to the, the British Empire, and they have these grooves cut into the road. Uh, these grooves are meant to fit the wheels of a Roman chariot. Uh, a chariot is this horse-drawn war uh, carriage open. You've seen them in the movies, right? Uh, and and the, the chariots themselves uh, were designed to be as lean and slim, to be fitting exactly behind two horses behind. So by proxy, the space shuttle size was constrained by the size of two horses' butts. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, this concept is called path constraint, and it's not, not something new, right? We're continuously forced to design new things with the past in mind. Uh, and AD is very much uh, something like, like this, right? It's, it's a legacy of, of a past, and, and, and it, it on itself has a lot of history on, and why AD was, was to become what AD is. Uh, luckily for, for new companies, right, 
they're not going to be bothered with AD. If you spin up a new company today, you're not going to be installing on-prem AD servers and, and manage your devices and stuff like that. But for almost any other company, you're going to have to have, or at least you have an AD uh, footprint that you might want to get rid of, especially as it sort of sunset and has played out its role as, as the main, main repository, right? Lucky for us, uh, the cloud world that we're living in, and at least migrating to, is not as constrained as the, uh, as the physical world. So these train tracks and, and rockets really don't matter as much for us, right? Uh, so today we're going to talk about why AD is obsolete, how Okta can help what we're working on and, and help you try and, and, and reduce your AD footprint. And notice I'm saying reduce here. I'm not saying get rid of completely, because unfortunately we're not going to be able to offer that solution to you today. And we're also going to listen to uh, Chick-fil-A's journey, because uh, they attacked this problem and went through it. And it's an, a completely fascinating story how they looked at it and what they eventually settled on and, and, and managed to, to make do. Um, a little bit of, of background history, right? AD was launched with Windows 2000 Professional. And I was, as I was doing my research for this presentation, um, I found you know, the old O'Reilly books that cover almost any subject uh, specifically for, for, for the technology that they were launched in. And this is the official O'Reilly book for Windows 2000. And as you can see, it has an ancient Roman road on the cover. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's foreshadowing or what, the <laughs> what was going on there. Right? <laughs> Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that AD set out to fix a bunch of problems that mostly aren't relevant today. If you think about it, this is 2000, that's 20 years ago. If you look at how a, a business was being run in 2000, you can sort of envision a place where you went to buy software in boxes from the, from the store, right? And, and your office had these desktop computers in beige plastic, and you would have a bunch of on-prem file servers and, and, and stuff like that, right? And, and what we see today is that companies, uh, as they move to the cloud, people don't work like that anymore. They bring their own device to work. They work with cloud services. And in a lot of cases, they're not even at work. They work remotely and then are out traveling, right? Um, so with the cloud, the need for an on-prem repository is almost completely gone. Uh, and, and, and sort of to, face, uh, to, to be realistic about it, and I think most people realize that, that AD is pretty fantastic for storing the actual employee data in it, but once you start expanding it to consultants and contractors, and in some cases customers, it, it starts to be a little bit uncomfortable, especially with all the groups and the security uh, st stuff there as well. So one thing that we see a lot of our customers are doing is they're migrating to a world where AD is a downstream application, and the HR system is taking the front seat. In that model, you would have the HR system, which really is the more appropriate uh, source of truth for who actually works in your, your corporation, would push the data down into Okta, and Okta would push that data down into all the other cloud applications, including Microsoft AD, to manage the on-prem stuff. And we are mindful that, uh, in a lot of cases, the, the HR system is not going to be the authoritative source for every attribute. So you're going to have stuff like phone numbers that might be managed by Ring Central or emails from the email server. In that case, we can push that data back into Okta and have Okta be the one-stop shop for the most current and up-to-date inf information. And we also see that this is really a place where most customers are comfortable storing data other than their organization data. So you can freely store uh, customer data in Okta without disrupting your security model, right? What this allows you to do is to minimize the footprint that AD has in your organization. So let's say you have 10,000 users in, in your organization, right? Maybe if you start to look at it, this is a pretty cloud-forward organization in this example. 9,000 of them, they're primarily using Box and Slack and Office 365 for their day-to-day -day work. They're not working with anything on-prem. So why don't we get rid of those guys from the AD, reduce the AD footprint to 1,000 people, which makes something way more easier to manage and, 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 and contain for, for the IT organization, right? Uh, so what about all the applications that you have on-prem on, on and that need to authenticate to Okta? Well, we're happy to announce that uh, our LDAP interface has finally hit general availability. This means that you can take those applications and you can, instead of pointing them to your on-prem LDAP servers, or in, in many cases an AD server, right, you can point them directly to Okta and do the authentication that way. And it also uh, has the benefit of adding stuff like two-factor authentication on top of, of LDAP calls and, and, and stuff like that. So that's a couple of things that you can do already today to try and, and minimize your AD footprint. But I'd like to welcome uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Simon Dali, on stage. And he's going to talk a little bit about what our roadmap and, and what we've, uh, we're looking at doing next year. Thanks. Awesome. 
Thank you, Marcus. How's it going, everyone? My name is Simon Dali. I'm the product manager for our director integrations team. That's everything to do with AD, LDAP, and our desktop SSO integrations. Marcus talked a lot about how AD can be this path constraint as you move to the cloud. Right? It really was made for its time and age uh, tw two decades ago almost. And as you kind of think about how you want to move forward and build an architect for the next decade uh, and in a cloud forward way, AD doesn't really make sense for you to build a foundation on. <clears throat> right? And what does that future look like? Uh, at Okta here, we envision uh, IT to be this fast, modern, agile uh, driven IT. <clears throat> right? And that can mean a lot of things. Uh, specifically, it means automations, uh, and less manual operations. It also means uh, single source and not uh, disparate sources. Because what we see in a lot of our customers is you have these disparate identity systems, whether that's 180, multiple domains, multiple forests, or in most cases, it's AD and LDAP and some other um, SQL databases. So now how can you consolidate all of that into one source to make it more agile? Um, it also means, best of breed, Todd, talk, Todd talked about this today on the keynote stage. It's a reality. Um, it also means day one access for your employees and doesn't mean thousands of uh, uh, access uh, tickets in your, uh, for, for your uh, IT help desk admins. Um, it also means user, user identities because what we see in a lot of cases uh, is shared accounts, right? One user or multiple users using one user account to log into workstations or uh, common apps. Most of all, it means more SaaS uh, and less, less maintenance for you. So uh, less costs, more efficiency uh, and, and fast. But at the same time, we understand that getting to this world, uh, it's not easy, right? There's a lot of uh, org processes that you need to worry about, a lot of budget constraints, uh, your org's growing, um, fewer team members, more burning issues, right? Th that's why um, I want you to think about this uh, as playing chess. Any chess players in the, cl in the crowd? Okay, a few. But one of the first things that you learn when you play chess is how do you get in better positions of mobility? Right? When you start off, you're not essentially saying, I'm going to check the king in two moves. No, what you're trying to do is trying to get in better and better positions of mobility to say, hey, I can actually think what my next five, six, seven steps are going to be. So I can get in a stage uh, that, that, that increases my chances of uh, checking the king and, win, king and winning the game. And this is very similar to that, is how can you get into better and better positions of mobility so you can actually think about what your cloud forward strategy is or what your strategy for the next 20 years and how, how you can build on top of that looks like. So whether, whether you're fully on-prem, right, and very rigid, where you have <clears throat> multiple AD and LDAP sources, multiple domains, multiple forests, figuring out how to consolidate that, that's a very big problem. Or you could be mostly on-prem, right, where you have a very small footprint in the cloud, maybe a few O365 uh, applications, uh, maybe Slack, maybe Zoom, but only a subset of users are using that. But you still have to worry about how, how do I manage all this on-prem complexity that I have, right? It's a very hard problem. Or you could be mostly cloud, where your only on-prem resources are a couple of applications or servers and printers and file shares um, <clears throat> that you need to worry about, but 90% of your users are in the cloud. Or you're fully cloud and agile, like Marcus talked about. And the challenge for us is figuring out how to help you get to the top two buckets there that I talked about. Um, <clears throat> and, and if you're using AD today, you're probably using it for a few different reasons, right? And the first and foremost being, how do you manage users? How do you manage groups? How do you manage credentials? How do you manage devices and servers, right? And how do you store that? And the next part is really, how do, you, how do you manipulate that, right? How do you apply policy, whether that's device join, whether that's network policy? How do you do that at scale? How do you do that at bulk, right, uh, group policy objects? And the next one is really, in tandem with ADFS or Okta, how do you do access, app access, server access, whatever that looks like? And if you really think about what these are, um, they really fit into a few buckets, right? The top bucket, user management, uh, group management, credentials, devices, it's really about how do you manage objects? And that's really about a directory. Right? How do you store these? How do you add schema? How do you change schema? How do you migrate that schema? Uh, how do you do password resets? All of that. And the next, next, next part is group policy. Uh, like I talked about, it's how do you do things at scale? How do you apply policy at scale? And if you really think about what that comes down to, if you reduce it, it's really all about workflow. Right? Um, and the next part, app access, server access, it's pretty straightforward. It's, uh, it's, it's just access. Now, as you go to various sessions throughout the day, uh, think about how you can apply this framework uh, and think about how you can use that um, to get in better positions of mobility with all the great things that we're building this upcoming year and the year after. With that in mind, um, 2018, uh, was, uh, we had a very big focus on flexibility. How do we become more flexible and how do we uh, become more scalable? So on the directory side, 
Um, there's no more uh, email restriction. We used to have an email restriction for the login field. That's no more the case. Uh, and same with imports. If you're importing uh, AD users from your AD into Okta, uh, there's no more first or last name requirement that you need to worry about. Uh, we, hear the lot, we hear a lot of that from our uh, APAC customers. And also linked objects are in UD now. What that means is if you have manager employee relationships, uh, you can also manage that in UD today. Um, and you also heard about hooks that Todd talked about today. Um, it's very valuable for a lot of import use cases that we see where you want to enhance a user profile or make a record in a different system um, that's available today as well. Um, and you heard Marcus talked about LDAP interface. Uh, for a long time, we didn't support compound and presence filters. So basically what that means is being able to write uh, very complex filters using ands and ors or you're doing wildcard searches. But that's available today. And we also made a lot of uh, desktop SSO IWA performance improvements uh, where we saw nearly 50% performance improvements for logins. Any DSSO users in the crowd? Okay, a few. Cool. Um, now, before we kind of look into 2018, uh, 2019, I kind of want to take a very quick history lesson. So Okta really started off as a very simple directory sync agent, right? Uh, what we did is really like a V0 of our current AD agent that you dropped onto your uh, Active Directory, and we pulled in the basic schema, right? It was just first name, last name, your username, uh, and a password. And you could do SSO into a couple applications. And you also pulled in some groups. But it was very, very small and very limited. But as we talked to more customers, we went into more uh, complex environments uh, with our customers, the need for like a real enterprise directory and lifecycle management became apparent. And that's how we built uh, Universal Directory uh, about three, four, four years ago, I think now. Um, where it's, you, you could do UD as a master, you could have native users in Okta, it had a more extended schema, uh, more applications, uh, and that's where the pattern of uh, HR as a master also started to emerge, uh, where you, re your uh, identities were really mastered in the cloud and then pushed down to downstream applications. But as we move into more and more uh, complex environments, see more complex customers, more uh, gnarly problems, the need for this uh, platform becomes more and more apparent. How do you morph? How do you how do you take any use case and make that possible for you? For you? And, and that's really how we're evolving to this like, directory and integration platform. And you heard a lot about that uh, in, the, in the keynote today, uh, is how do, we, how do we become this directory platform where it's customizable schema, customizable data types, generic objects, uh, and also workflow. Right? With that in mind, 2019's focus is a lot about this customization and flexibility. How do we become a platform? Right? And, and with that in mind, I'm going to uh, take you through this framework again of uh, directory. Uh, it's really, again, all about users, groups, credentials, and devices. Right? Uh, so one of the things uh, that's going to come second half of the year is group profiles. So if you have, uh, if you have the use case of uh, uh, pushing mail-enabled security groups from AD into O365 to help reduce that group management in AD, you can do that with group profiles. It's going to be available the second half of the year. Uh, and then we're also going to have uniqueness on uh, UD objects. So being able to enforce uniqueness and have Okta take care of how do you manage that uniqueness on a specific attribute or an object um, that's also going to be available uh, in the second half of the year. Uh, and you kind of heard about uh, the identity engine Todd talked about today. And one of the core concepts of that is user types. It's going to be a native uh, object uh, in UD. But basically, the way it works uh, is you can have users of different types in your organization, right? Contractors. Uh, temp workers, uh, interns, full-time employees, and each of them have their own workflows. Uh, how do you, how you onboard them, what apps they get, uh, what policies they have. And, and, and user types is really a way of figuring out and defining what those users are in your organization. Um, and on the credential side, uh, one thing that we hear a lot is how do I easily and seamlessly migrate my profile or credential master from AD uh, into Okta? So one of the first things that's going to come out in the second half of the year Q3, Q4, is uh, how do you demaster, migrate that profile and credential from AD into Okta, whether that's on an import or a Dell auth JIT flow, uh, that you can quickly get that password from AD and make that user Okta mastered. Again, it kind of goes back to that uh, analogy I gave earlier, is how do we get you into better positions of mobility uh, to make faster um, and more efficient decisions for your IT? Uh, and also credential migration, uh, this is available today where uh, we have various hash, uh, hashes that you can directly migrate into Okta. Uh, whether that's a legacy identity system that you have or maybe an LDAP server that only a few apps and users are using. Um, and on the devices side, uh, we're investing in making devices a first-class citizen in Okta. That means having an actual device platform, devices in Okta. 
Uh, the team's heads down working on that. Uh, that should be available also in the second half of the year. And that's really to feed into our uh, Okta and VMware device trust and device management capabilities. Um, and if you're interested more in that, I highly recommend that you guys attend uh, the security roadmap that's going to happen today and also tomorrow. There's two sessions for that. Um, now on the sync and workflow side, sync and workflow is kind of interesting because it's really about um, <clears throat> how do you pull in data and how do you push that data out, but also about how do you, like, what do you use to get that data. And so that's really divided into imports uh, and what we're doing with our agents, uh, which is these lightweight, ag lightweight agents that you can deploy onto your AD uh, or perhaps LDAP server that you have. And on the import side, uh, one of the things we're uh, going to release uh, in the next couple of months is going to be advanced import matching rules. Uh, this is available today if you're using Workday, for example, but it's not available in AD or LDAP yet. Uh, but this basically enables you to do uniqueness check or uh, uh, check for collisions and imports. And also granular import scheduling. Uh, today, if you want to schedule uh, incremental imports, uh, th there's very uh, tight things, uh, very tight um, uh, options for, for what that can be, maybe an hour a day. But we're, ex we're, we're, we're extending that to say uh, whether you want it to be every 10 seconds, uh, every one minute, every three minutes, every three and a half minutes. Whatever that looks like, whatever that what workflow is, again, going back to our, to, to our focus on making it more customizable and flexible. Um, one of the things that we hear a lot is I want to have visibility into how I'm doing my imports, uh, how fast they are, uh, what, the, what the progress is. So that's also going to be one of the things we'll release later in the year. Um, and we're also making uh, ongoing, again, that scale focus. It's an ongoing focus. It's not just like a one-time focus. It's how do we enable you to pull that data as fast as you can. Uh, and, and, and push it out as fast as, fast as you can to whatever system you need it to. Um, and on the agent side, one of the things we also hear a lot is if I'm managing uh, like multiple agents, how do I auto-install them? How, do I, uh, how can I move to a more DevOps model? Again, it kind of goes back to that uh, metaphor of how do, you make, how, how do I become more uh, mobile and agile? So we're investing in uh, making, uh, building out headless agent installations. And the, one thing after that we're going to build right after is API operations for the agents. What that really means is being able to integrate uh, with our workflow tool uh, and being able to do downstream actions in AD, whether that's moving users between OUs, changing user lifecycle status, resetting a password, uh, maybe like deleting a user, whatever that is, based on some triggers or actions that happen in Okta or some other system, uh, how can you uh, have a downstream effect of that in AD? How do you keep that in sync with the rest of your systems? Um, uh, that's the automation use cases part. And also, we're also going to invest heavily in uh, improving our reporting and troubleshooting. Uh, this way kind of goes back to how you can move faster and troubleshoot quicker uh, with, with, with all the issues that you, you might be seeing. Uh, and on the access part, Marcus talked about LDAP interface. It's GA right now. Uh, uh, and a few things that we're going to build out in the second half of the year is moving to an app-based model. So what that means is let's say you have five or six applications that you want to use LDAP interface for. Uh, you should, you'll be able to define what the schema for each one of them looks like. Uh, and also, if you want to enforce MFA on these LDAP applications on a one-app basis, uh, you'll be able to do that. What that also means is you can enforce authorization based on these AD or LDAP groups that you're pulling in uh, from AD. Again, goes back to how you can become more mobile by reducing that reliance um, on Active Directory. And you, you guys heard about uh, advanced server access today. Uh, one of the coolest features I've seen that we've built uh, one of my favorite products. Uh, it's basically cert-based access for any Linux server. I highly recommend you guys go take a look at how that works um, and how it can help you. Um, and also, we're investing a lot in device trust. Uh, you saw that Okta and VMware and device platform slide I had earlier about how we're investing in uh, making devices a first-class citizen. And so what that also means is how, how are you able to enforce policy and access controls on all these devices, right? Because you have a lot of people, or a lot of your employees are bringing their, in their own devices, accessing all kinds of applications. Uh, how do you enforce that? Um, so keep, keep an eye out for all the device trust uh, improvements that are going to come out later in the year. Now. Enough of my talk. Uh, let's keep it real. So I want to invite uh, one of our awesome customer success managers, Marissa Henderson, and one of our visionary customers, um, Ryan Walker from Chick-fil-A. Thank you. Thanks, Sai. Exciting things to come. To bring our time together today full circle, it's my pleasure to introduce Ryan Walker from Chick-fil-A. Morning. <laughs> Jumped ahead, Ryan. Um, to take us on Chick-fil-A's journey of how they're working to reduce their footprint in Active Directory. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I really enjoyed the keynote this morning. I hope you all did. Good. 
Good. So let's start off. So for those in the audience who might not know about your company, can you tell us a little bit about Chick-fil-A? Yeah, so Chick-fil-A was founded in 1946 in Hapeville, Georgia by Truett Cathy. And he really ran this one really small diner until 1967 when Chick-fil-A as we know it today really started. So Chick-fil-A as a brand started in 67. We're now uh, over 2,200 restaurants around the country. Our revenues last year uh, just, just crested over $10.5 billion. And later this year, we, hoping to, we hope to open in Canada for the first time. So tell us about Chick-fil-A's history with Active Directory. Sure. So we, we go all the way back to the beginning. Um, I call this IAM 0.1 in 2000 when we installed Active Directory. So these are some of the common use cases for Active Directory. I'm sure you're familiar with most of these. Um, you may be jealous of our Active Directory. We're single forest, single domain, eight domain controllers, and that's it. Uh, we do have three sites, so that adds a little bit of complexity, but not much. Um, so we really started using Active Directory initially, as, as Cy uh, talked about, really just for users. They're for users and credentials, and since we had this directory, now we're controlling permissions to network file shares. We're able to stand up Microsoft Exchange for email. Um, then around 2004, we started bringing on a, a web portal. So this was something new to us. How do we authenticate users to log into something on a website? Uh, since we had Active Directory and it was doing authentications for our desktops already, we just extended that for our web use as well. The problem with that is Active Directory is very expensive. Uh, when we started talking about adding 50,000 users to Active Directory, that's not cows that we wanted to pay for. Um, additionally, we, we, we didn't want to, before this, uh, we had spreadsheets with everybody's username and everybody's password and the whole company. Um, so that was not a good idea. So we, we actually brought in this sync engine. We wrote it ourselves. It's based on .NET, and it was a neat way for us to get identities from our HR system into Active Directory. Again, those 50,000 team members plus all our restaurant operators and uh, support center people. But we also wrote our own web application security, which we call WAS, and this is our custom authorization model. So our initial web portal that we brought in, we used Active Directory for authentication and WAS for authorization. Then we decided to grow up a little bit, and this is what I would call Identity 1.0. So around 2004, 2005, we, we were doing this sync engine thing that we wrote ourselves, but it was getting cumbersome really fast. So we brought in Oracle Identity Manager to help us streamline this process. So we used OIM to provision to Active Directory where necessary, and then for cost reasons, we pulled all of our team members out of Active Directory and instead used Microsoft's Atom product. Now it's called ADLDS. So we use that as our enterprise directory. So everybody gets an account in ADLDS. We're still using uh, WAS for authorization, and this, this really worked. This, this worked for a while. But fast forward a few years, we started seeing the need for something better. So how long have you been an Okta customer, and how does Okta fit into your identity strategy? Right, so it was around 2014, 15, that we really started seeing the need for more cloud-based identity. And we didn't want to expose Active Directory to the cloud. So we really started looking across the market to see what can be that identity uh, as a service for us in the cloud. We were calling it Cloud IDP at the time. We had our own IDP that we wrote based on OpenSAML, but maintaining that and the connections in there was getting pretty cumbersome. So we wanted a platform that would make it easier. So we'd settled on Okta and really had four main priorities for that project. First and foremost, we wanted high availability of authentication. We had all of our authentications coming through a single data center, and if that fiber gets cut, or both fibers get cut, then we're sunk. Even though we have all this SaaS that we've been standing up and single sign-on integrations, all that's lost if we can't actually authenticate the user. So we needed high availability of authentication. We needed single sign-on, something easier for us to set up and maintain than what we were doing with OpenSAML. We needed password self-service, which we actually wrote ourselves about 10 years ago, uh, but I never felt comfortable with the security around it, so we, we shelved it, and then we brought Okta in, that's when we really started using password self-service. And then lastly is multi-factor. So we were already using multi-factor in a few places, uh, but we really wanted to expand that and have multi-factor available for all of our users, all the way down to the team members in our restaurants. So how does Okta factor into your plans to reduce your dependence on Active Directory? Great question. Let, let me back up one slide if we can. Something I should point out that's very important here. When we brought Okta in, 
we chose not to use AD Sync. And for us, that was a no-brainer because we didn't have all of our users in Active Directory. So what we decided to do instead, because OIM is really the center of our identity world, and at this point we have three HR systems as a master, uh, we didn't want to try to rewrite all of those integrations directly to Okta. We simply leveraged our investment in OIM, and OIM is calling APIs at Okta. So from our standpoint, they're Okta mastered users to use the official language, but really they come from various HR systems consolidated into OIM, and then OIM writes those users into Okta. We'll go forward. So how are we using Okta? Um, we're using it for authentication, as I mentioned. So we, again, we needed something that was not a single point of failure for all of our authentication. So it's handling all the authentication. With that, it's single sign-on to almost 200 applications that we have set up. I mentioned multi-factor. We're, we're slowly removing the dependence on our old multi-factor multi solution, moving those connections over to Okta as well. So like remote desktop sign-in in our managed data center, we have multi-factor on those. We were using another solution. We're working to implement Okta's remote desktop MFA instead. And then lastly, LDAP. So LDAP is really a, a, a point using the LDAP as a service that Cy talked about. Our going in position is looking to see if LDAP as a service with Okta can solve the LDAP needs of an application coming in the door. If it cannot, and that application is in our managed data center, then we will entertain hooking it up to either ADLDS or as a last result to AD directly. It's been helpful for us to not have all of our user base in Active Directory. Again, initially it was a, it was a cost reason that we didn't have them all there. But now that we don't have them there, if an application comes to me and says, hey, we need team members and we need LDAP, then I can take AD off the list immediately. We don't have to even consider that. We'll first look at Okta as a cloud solution. If that doesn't work, and again, they're in the managed data center, then we'll talk about using ADLDS. So all of these things being said, I mean, what do you, what do you still see as Acti on Active Directory, and how are you planning to address these dependencies? Yeah, so let me, let me give a good example here. Anybody experience the Office 365 effect? <laughs> When, when we migrated to Office 365 in 2016, this was just before we signed with Okta. So we were migrating from a third-party email provider over to Office 365. When we did that, we needed a place to authenticate users and a way to provision them there that was completely different than what we were doing with this third-party provider. So we had to quickly stand up ADFS. We had to stand up Azure AD Connect. So Azure AD Connect, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's loosely based on MIM, and that's the way that we're provisioning from our on-prem Active Directory up to Office 365 for the users. For licensing, got a smart colleague in the room, wrote a bunch of PowerShell scripts. That handles the licensing for us. And then for authentication, we're, we're, we're using ADFS. Because we stood up ADFS in the Managed Data Center and we didn't have Okta yet, we had a bunch of other applications that didn't want to use OpenSAML and they jumped on ADFS. So that's what I call the 365 effect. Because we made the choice to migrate to Office 365, then we had to bring in ADFS and then I had all these other things jump on board with that. So we've been working to unravel that recently and using Okta instead. So all the connections that we're talking to ADFS, we are slowly moving all of those over to Okta. So we've moved Office 365 to Okta. We've moved a lot of the SSO apps, and AWS was a big one for us. We moved ADFS, uh, excuse me, all these acronyms, moved AWS SSO to Okta and got that off of ADFS. I'm going to give a little plug here. If you're not, if you haven't turned off legacy authentication for Office 365 and go with just modern auth, I highly encourage you to look at that. Okta makes it easy to turn that legacy auth off. That's a lot of the attacks that we're seeing. They're trying to attack that legacy protocol connecting to Office 365. We didn't have as good a visibility when that was in ADFS, but now that we've moved authentication over to Okta, we've got a really good visibility into the attacks that we're getting from a, from a global perspective against our Office 365 tenant. And by turning off that legacy protocol and just using modern auth, we've eliminated a lot of those attacks being able to get in. The last piece here is Azure AD Connect, and I've, I'm showing that with a dotted line because we haven't completed that one yet. We're still talking with Okta on how can we move the provisioning piece from what we're doing with Azure AD Connect and instead rely on Okta for that. 
So Okta has almost all of the users that exist in 365. So our work is to provision those users into Okta and then allow Okta to take on the provisioning of those users into Office 365. So that will allow us to eliminate two of the Microsoft technologies that were brought in just as a result of 365. So what advice can you give to our audience about their use of Active Directory moving forward? Um, first thing is just start with an inventory. Know what you have and then start from there. Uh, I, I like Sai's uh, metaphor with the chess, ga chess game. You've got to think a few moves ahead. In order to think a few move, moves ahead, you need to understand what the layout of the board is right now. So s do an inventory. How much Active Directory do you have? How many domains, forest, domain controllers? And then once you've established what you have, figure out what's talking to it. What applications are in your managed data center or in the cloud even that are talking back into Active Directory? And then prioritize and just start chipping away at those things. So this slide is, again, going back to the beginning of the deck, this is where we used Active Directory, and my mindset now is Active Directory should only be for the managed data center. If it's not in the managed data center, it has no business talking to Active Directory or relying on it in any way. If it's anything to do with cloud, it needs to rely on cloud systems, not Active Directory and managed data center. So I'll throw out a whole bunch of buzzwords here. So consumerization of IT, leads to BYOD, which now zero trust networking, all these, all these buzzwords, phrases that we have are really leading me to think about, I don't, I don't need them talking to Active Directory anymore. If our users want to bring their own device, which they're already doing with their, their phones and their iPads, we're not managing those devices. Since they're logging in with their own device, let them do that. If we can take that one step further, why do we need to provide them a domain joined computer? They want to bring their own computer anyway. Let's get them off the domain. Let's figure out the minimum amount of device management that we need to do. I'm excited about this idea of device trust and device management from Okta. Can we manage that device just enough so that we trust it to allow that user to log in? Not a full lifecycle management of the device anymore. So that gets workstations off of the domain. Again, servers need to be there because AD is for the managed data center. And this is my opinion. So if workstations aren't there and only servers are there for devices, then the only users we need there are users who need to log into servers. So we can take our footprint of users in Active Directory and cut 95% of those users out. Groups, permissions, net, around, really around network file shares. So this is, if, if you've got great ideas here, the problem that we're facing is we've got a, a legacy file share we call the H drive. It's got like 10 terabytes of data but nobody wants to step up and move that data. It's too complex, there's stuff out there. We know we need it, we just don't know where it is, we don't know how it's protected, what groups and permissions are in place. So this is the part I think is, we use the term the long pole in the tent. That one's gonna be tough for us to overcome. Because we've made the move to Okta, and Okta is really the front door authentication for us now, we don't really have a need for password policy in Active Directory. Again, this is if we can get uh, domain join workstations out of Active Directory, then we don't need to enforce any password policy there. Not for the mass of users, only for managed data center users. I already mentioned client management a little bit. We used SMS back in the day. We're using SM SCCM a little bit today. Um, I'm excited to hear the session about VMware. We're looking at things like Workspace ONE and Intune as a way to do what I would call device management light. It's not a heavy SCCM where we're managing the entire life cycle of the device. We want to do just enough to get a, a trust level with that device. I already mentioned Office 365, so we've made the move there. We don't have any on-prem dependency on email except for Azure AD Connect, which we're working on. And then the last one that I skipped there were DNS and DHCP. So years ago, we made the switch away from AD integrated DNS to instead use a, an appliance-based DNS and DHCP so we don't have that dependency in Active Directory anymore. So these are just some examples, kind of my thoughts on it. But again, start with an inventory. What do you have as far as AD? And then what's talking to it? And then prioritize as those systems move to the cloud or new systems come online, do they really need to talk to AD? And what can you do? To, to reduce the dependence on, on AD. Great stuff, Ryan. Thank you so much for taking us on your journey. I'm sure this resonates with many, if not most, of the folks in the audience here today. So we are going to open it up for some Q&A. 
Um, I think we're going to have a mic runner. So if you have any questions, raise your hands. We'll put the lights on a little bit and uh, get things rolling. Hi, we're running into a similar issue with H drives and all that, as you mentioned. Um, are there any technologies? I know, you know, Box is a big partner. We're kind of looking at a few different. Have you um, investigated any cloud file server based solutions in this exercise? So we've had some pockets within IT that have looked at Box, looked at Dropbox. Um, because we're using 365, we're using a lot of OneDrive and SharePoint. So those have helped um, kind of stem the growth a little bit. It's still growing, but not as fast as it was before. Um, I'm working with a project right now with our legal department to move a lot of their data off of this old legacy H drive and out to a cloud-based solution. So I think that's really the opportunity. It may not be one system to, to lift and shift the whole thing. It may be pockets of you know, departments around the business that they see a need, they see a solution that's applicable for them. We help them move their piece of data off of that H drive and slowly chip away at it that way. So the question was, have we had any problems with audit and compliance and moving that identity data out of Active Directory? Um, not for us so far. So part of the, the, the story of Chick-fil-A that I, I failed to mention is we're a private company, so we, we don't have as much regulatory and compliance needs. Now, as we look to expand, I mentioned Canada, we're looking at Europe later on, uh, we're going to have to start meeting some of those compliance and regulations. Uh, but we haven't really had the strict regulations that I think a lot of you as public companies are dealing with. We are uh, currently running delegated authentication to AD from Okta, and we're kind of on the doorstep of being able to turn off several thousand users in our, our environment due to some changes to one of our internally developed apps. What's our best course of action as we deprovision those users out of AED is to transferring them up to authentication in Okta because currently what I've seen so far they're dropped in with a no password and it gets a little bit of cumbersome when we make that transition. <coughs> so I, I, Somebody from I Okta can that. field that one. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very common pattern that we see um, uh, customers asking. So one of, the, one of the things that I talked about in my roadmap presentation was uh, uh, the, the migrating, mi migration of credential master piece. Uh, so once you uh, really understand that, okay, these subset of users, they don't really have uh, these on-prem uh, apps anymore. They don't really need access to that. Uh, this feature will really help you get there, which is um, on the next login or on the next import, I want, you, I want Okta to import these credentials into Okta and make them Okta mastered. So that uh, then now they can access whatever applications that they have in Okta that are integrated, that they have access to, uh, and you're good to go. This is more of an Okta question. When are you going to approach um, allowing more flexibility and usability in the querying of nested groups within Active Directory? That's a, that's a very good question. So we hear about nested groups a lot. Uh, what we're investing this year is how to improve the underlying performance of groups. Uh, but I think nested groups is kind of uh, beyond the scope of this year. But uh, on that note, um, please reach out. Like I'll, 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 uh, <clears throat> my, my email is site.madali at octa.com. Uh, reach out to me with the uh, details, and I'll reach out to you when we, when we start research and talking more about nested groups. Can you talk a little bit more about um, how you're um, utilizing return on investment for uh, utilizing Okta and, uh, in this, and minimizing the AD uh, space, uh, both for Chick-fil-A and if uh, you can provide some general numbers as well? Because one of the questions we're always being asked, especially by our CFO, is like, okay, hey, what type of return? I've spent six figures on this solution. <clears throat> what are we realizing in terms of efficiencies, dollars saved, et cetera? Uh, for, for me, I'm helping to make that case by seeing what we can turn off. How much, how much, t how much of our time and resources to, to run old systems like ADFS or Azure AD Connect, how much are we spending on those versus how much we're spending to move to Okta? So the more things that we can move to Okta, we're maximizing the investment really that we've already made. And if we can turn off that technical debt, then we, we stop worrying about that. For me, and part of wanting to move away from Azure AD Connect is that's I tell people that's a time bomb to me. We brought in a vendor to help us set up Azure AD Connect. It's running, but we don't really know a whole lot about it. If it stops working for some reason, then that's a risk that we're trying to mitigate by moving away from it. I don't want to invest 
my own time and resources and money in skilling up on Azure AD Connect when I know it's something already on the roadmap to get rid of. So minimizing the risk and then kind of trying to compare the cost that we're going to save by turning these old systems off. And that cost may be a minimum amount of you know, infrastructure cost, but it's more the effort to keep them patched and updated and healthy and running versus we've already made the investment in Okta, let's move those systems over. I think <clears throat> that's all the questions we have. We're going to get kicked out for the next session. But I'll hang out outside, um, and we can talk. But don't, please don't forget to rate us on the Octane mobile app and really think about how you can get into better positions of mobility. Thank you very much. Thank you all.